Today I'm going to talk about quantum impact benchmark. You don't need to know what an impact it is. And this is joint work with a very impressive uh, second year grad student, Yulong Dong from Berkeley. This is the paper and uh, this is the GitHub link for the software. So finally, now we have a few quantum computers. Ask a, maybe a little bit stupid question. How many quantum computers will we need? For classical computers, and there's a famous upper bound by Watson made in 1943, which is about five. It was really underestimated. And uh, what this shows is that prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. So let's now make some prediction. It will be say 10,000 quantum computers. I don't know whether this is true, but what we're almost certain is that the future quantum computers don't look like this. So now among the 10,000 quantum computers, we wanna select the top 500. How do we do the job? First, let's ask how to do the same job for classical supercomputers. This list was generated last month and which is the uh, top 500 for classical supercomputers. Number one is now a Japanese supercomputer called the Fugaku. Uh, the important thing for this talk is that in order to show up on this list, every machine needs to turn in something called a high performance lean pack benchmark. And uh, uh, I will introduce what that is. But now uh, let's say the number is uh, for 400 petaflops. We ask what is lean pack and why lean pack? So the lean pack benchmark is based on that we're interested in using supercomputers for scientific computing applications. And uh, solving linear systems, as we just heard from Andres, is uh, the building block for numerous scientific computing applications. And the classical impact benchmark is the following. You want to solve AX equals to B with some dense random matrices. And these dense random matrices have no obvious applications. Reminds me, reminds us a little bit about quantum supremacy. As you can possibly imagine, there has been some controversy over its effectiveness since the very early days and alternative benchmarks have been proposed, uh, and, uh, but it's still solving some linear systems with some random sparsity patterns. Although there is a controversy, this Limpact benchmark has been used to define the top 500 list since the very beginning of the list. And this talk is about the quantum Limpact benchmark. So I would like to think about quantum, quantum advantage is like if we're climbing the quantum Mount Everest, it's pretty high, after a very long way, we have reached the so-called quantum supremacy. You look up uh, toward the sky and that's quantum advantage. And the punchline of this talk is that the quantum impact benchmark, one, is something that pro you probably want to do. And the two is that unless we have found that uh, uh, there is a very shortcut directly along the cliff, uh, and uh, this is actually some middle ground that is only steps away from the Google's quantum supremacy test. So we have just heard that uh, the uh, quantum linear system problem is to prepare a quantum state that is a proportional to A inverse B. How to get the information of the A and B into a quantum computer is a very nasty business. It's called the reading problem. And uh, in order to quantify the complexity for solving linear systems, there are two important things. One is the condition number of the matrix, and two is target accuracy. And uh, with some proper assumptions on A, for example, it's a D-sparse matrix, so that the oracle getting access to A scales only as a poly N, where the matrix itself is exponentially larger, then we can potentially achieve exponential speed up. So in the past few years, uh, I mean, starting from the groundbreaking HHL algorithm, in the past few years, there have been very significant progresses in the past few years, like LCU, QSVT, and also later we might hear about the randomization method by Rolando Soma and collaborators. And uh, we also contributed along this line uh, called the time optimal adiabatic quantum computing and the eigenstate filtering. This is a joint with the two brilliant uh, grad students in the math department at Berkeley, Dong Wan and Yu Tong. Uh, and we have together achieved the near optimal complexity matching the lower bounds. So the, this talk is about the quantum benchmark. I wanna say that all those algorithms used directly for real applications, 
will probably require full fault tolerance on the computer to get anywhere. And uh, this is really because getting the matrix into the quantum computer alone, for example, using LCU itself, I mean, before solving the linear system, can already be prohibitively expensive on near-term devices, uh, will likely remain so for some time. But the quantum impact benchmark is a little bit different. We ask a different question. Do we really need or want to generate random numbers classically and then get them into a quantum computer, say via QRAM? That doesn't sound like a great idea. So the idea is we want to borrow from the success of Google's supremacy test. So what is Google's supremacy test? It's basically a big random unitary matrix. It's almost drawn from the high matter. And, uh, but uh, it's a unitary. Uh, linear algebra usually works with the non-unitary matrices, which have just heard the block encoding. Let me say it again, which is, I think, it's a really great idea that you, you take the upper block, uh, upper left diagonal block of an n uh, qubit matrix, you put it as the upper left diagonal block of an n plus one qubit unitary matrix. And this unitary matrix denoted by UA can be random. The fact is that even though you just uh, uh, added one ancilla qubit, you can uh, represent in principle any n qubit matrix up to some scaling. This is the block encoding. And what we're going to talk about today is the so-called random circuit block encoding matrix. That is, this matrix is block encoded by a random circuit or rack band. So uh, as in the cartoon here, uh, this is an n plus one qubit, uh, pretty chaotic random circuit. And this is the matrix you actually care about. It's a rack band. You can think that it is a, a proper generalization of this uh, random or pseudo random matrices in, uh, in the quantum context. And here, what I'm showing you is that this is not just some abstract concept. It's uh, something that is very, very implementable. I'm taking this copy map from uh, one of the IBM Q's computer. I'll be more than happy to try it on Google's computer and uh, in the future. And uh, so there are five qubits. I get rid of zero. Now it will be used as a signal qubit later. I have four qubits. And I want to generate a random circuit using completely elementary things, U1, U2 gates, and C0. That's it. So there are four qubits. I generate a random, uh, random circuit completely respecting the copy map of this uh, uh, architecture. Now I want to trace out, trace out is not the rigorous word, what you actually do with this. So you take this qubit one, make it the, to take zero. You have three qubits left. You end up with a three qubit rack band or an eight by eight matrix. As you can see, this is a very flexible way to construct a non-unitary matrix with respect to almost any given copy map of a quantum architecture. So this is totally near term. Let me show you that the error of the rack band on IBM Q. Uh, I mean, the, the error, I mean, the, what you can do is basically to marry the success probability of marrying zero and uh, to get this A acting on zero N. Of course, you can change this thing. Uh, the important thing is that it didn't blow up. I mean, uh, if you, as you know, uh, if you, uh, uh, these numbers are not particularly large. And uh, also, if you increase the number of system qubits, the growth is relatively uh, uh, mildly. And we hope that with, uh, for example, Google's better architecture, the result there will be even smaller. But this kind of 20%-ish of relative error will be used uh, as a kind of baseline for understanding the results of a quantum impact and other results later. Uh, so I don't have that much time to talk about technical details, but thanks to Andres' talk, we have seen this uh, beautiful circuit. Indeed, you can use the same circuit and to do very different tasks. Uh, I'm going to show solving linear systems, time series, spectral matter, computing thermal energy, all with an uh, important one called Hermitianized rack band. And uh, if you're interested, you can look at our paper, how to construct that. It's a, it's a very simple construction. Using this uh, QSVT, uh, you can actually always use an even order polynomial to compute a matrix function of this Hermitian rack band. Uh, even order polynomial is a very important thing because uh, this, Q this QSVT depends very crucially on the parity of the polynomials, either even or odd. And, but the even is usually easier to work with. 
you always add one extra ancillary qubit. That's why I reserved the qubit zero before. And uh, you can prepare this thing. There's not even toffoli gate. All these things are just a C naught. And uh, they follow the natural layout of the quantum circuit and can run without even calling a transpiler. That's using the language of IBM Q. And uh, I saw in the chat before how to obtain the phase factors. Uh, they in, again, in the past two years or so, there have been uh, quite significant progress along this way. Uh, our method is called optimization-based method, can allow you to get very high accuracy for phase factors, which is about polynomial of, of order 10,000. So uh, let's look at some uh, numerical results. And this H is a Hermitianized version of a rack band. And what I want to do is to solve this particular linear system. And uh, in order to really talk about the error, we compute the error or the accuracy of the success probability. Uh, if you want to generalize that to something like a cross entropy test, that's probably doable as well. Another thing I want to say is that all these linear systems are completely tunable. You can make the condition number to be anywhere you want, and uh, uh, which is a well-conditioned thing. Later, we're going to talk about the hardness uh, uh, in the end. So you can, uh, at least on the near-term device, we can imagine that the circuit depth will probably have a very important impact in terms of the accuracy indeed. So if the number of phase factors is uh, relatively small, which is about three, and you indeed get some accuracy that is reasonable. But if you increase the circuit depth, and uh, which is uh, the phase factors becomes 11, and uh, uh, the error becomes much larger, and uh, it is what it is. Uh, on the right-hand side, we uh, do it on the QVM, which is we dump uh, the error model from IBM Q, tailor it a bit, and then use one single number called the sigma to dial between the sigma equal to zero, which means there's no error, or there's only a measurement error, and one, which is a full error. And you can see that as uh, kappa increases, indeed, uh, the error will also increase, and, but, but uh, uh, all these things can behave relatively smoothly, especially for the well-conditioned case. If the error, the system behaves better than this, we can really have the hope of getting something meaningful in the NISC error. You can to do, uh, use it to do time series analysis. Also, this is thanks to the, Q, the flexibility provided by quantum single value transformation. And uh, what you do is you generate a Hermitianized uh, HREC band here called H. And you can view this as a matrix function. And uh, you compute this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, quantum simulation problem. Uh, important thing is there's no trotter whatsoever going on here. Every circuit. Uh, looks like the same, which is what we showed before, that the QSVT circuit. Uh, this is the results on the QVM. Again, if the error uh, becomes small and it looks really nice, uh, T goes from zero to 10, uh, but uh, when the error becomes larger, still the qualitative shape seems to be preserved, but uh, the error is very non negligible. Uh, you can use it to compute the spectral matter. And uh, uh, here we use the plan A formula uh, instead of doing first doing the Hamiltonian simulation, and then you do the inverse Fou uh, Fourier transform, you can actually solve a linear system with a little bit of broadening, uh, which corresponds to a Lorentzian broadening, and uh, directly compute this. Again, you can see that for different number of qubits, this is like a matrix of sub, side at uh, 1,000. And uh, uh, when the error rate is relatively small, and at least the qualitative features uh, uh, is preserved very well. Uh, this is a, a, to compute the thermal energy, which is to compute the ratio between the two traces. Uh, this one is a bit trickier, but also very interesting. Here we use the minimal uh, entangled typical uh, thermal uh, state algorithm called METIS, uh, developed originally by Steve White in 2009, also used by uh, Mota and the Gardner Chance Group uh, in the uh, paper on this uh, kite thing that was presented also last year in the Google Symposium. Uh, what is very interesting is that, as you can see, even with the near-term device, the error was so large. This on the left is uh, the result obtained directly on the IBM Q. And at least for all the cases as beta, the inverse temperature increases, the qualitative features, they're all preserved. And some of them, they look uh, unbelievably good. I would say that's a probable coincidence. 
On the right is not a coincidence, uh, where again, this is from QVM, uh, so the error becomes smaller and smaller, and you can see it gracefully uh, converges to the correct result. So let me now conclude. So uh, what I talked about here is uh, how to solve linear systems, not with uh, a particular real application, but with a rack band, or so basically you can think dense random matrices. Uh, this is called the quantum impact benchmark. It uses a supremacy type of circuit as a building block. Uh, so far we haven't tried the supremacy circuit, but you can see it's, uh, you can do that. It can be very easily engineered with respect to almost any architecture because you can really literally do the uh, phys logical to cu physical map, uh, qubit mapping yourself. And it's very, very simple. And maybe this is only steps away from the supremacy test. What about the hardness? Uh, I don't have a proof, but the intuitively it looks like hard. The reason is that even getting each UA, that is the supremacy circuit is already hard. And this QSVT circuit, what it does is just to have this UA, UA dagger, UA, UA dagger interleave with some very simple phase factors. And hopefully we can show rigorously that this is also hard. And uh, uh, you can also use more quantitative ways to measure the success uh, and the classical hardness, such as cross entropy or linear rise to a cross entropy test. So uh, we have uh, the codes, and this is a, to generate the QSP phase factors. And this is the rack band. Feel free to play and to let us know how you think about that. These are some of the papers related to linear systems. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.